Deborah Lamb, who is, uh, comes to archaeology for an interesting route through a degree in classics at uh, Cambridge. Um, but her PhD is very relevant to us here. She has uh, got a PhD in the Iron Age of Shetland from Bradford University. So um, she's going to put the Viking Age in context. She's going to do a bit before the Viking Age and a bit after. And she's going to tell us about access by sea and changes in settlement. Um, she's worked on archaeological excavations in Shetland, Orkney, and Caithness. And um, another side to her, she's an enthusiastic sea kayaker. And um, she's begun to look at the landscape from the sea, um, and it's given her a different perspective on, on the land. Um, so, Deborah. Thank you, Andrew. I'm going to look at one particular part of Shetland and at the rise and decline of particular settlements in the period 200 to 1300, because I think, in part, their changing fortunes can be traced to changing accessibility from the sea. And this is the place we're talking about. Oh, wrong button. Which one should I press? Enter? No. Ah, oh, that one. Nope. Okay, I've got some sort of fancy system here. No. from the south or the west, you want to avoid the reefs and, sh and currents around North East Orkney, and you especially want to avoid the roaring tideway through um, the Fair Isle Gap. So if you take a, a route west, wide to the west of Shetland, you come in in this part of mainland Shetland, and especially to these three attractive islands with their low shores and sheltered landfall. These three islands, they're, um, these two are nowadays called West Borough and East Borough, but for the sake of ease of listening, I'm going to use their old names. This is Borough, this is Hus, and this is Trondra. Now, they're actually three separate islands. Borough and Hus almost touch, but we're talking of literally as about a metre, two metres between them, and we're talking a few centimetres of water at low tide. So it's not very useful. Between Hus and Trondra, we have stream sand here. Stream sand is also quite shallow. It's full of shoal. It's only about three meters deep. And we also have a passage here nowadays, up in the northeast corner of Trondra. It's actually got a bar sticking out underwater called the Mussel Scarp. So the actual channel, again, is quite narrow, but it's around four meters deep. It's got a bit of a tidal flow, half a knot, 25 meters a second in new money. In terms of access, the three islands are mutually accessible. Short distances over land, and as comes up again and again in this conference, small boats can easily travel across those very sheltered and shallow seas. But they can also expect visitors from out with Shetland. Around 200, beginning of our period, Shetlanders are living in a number of settlements throughout Shetland. Some of these settlements are isolated, some are clustered around the remains of a broch. By 350 to 525, we've got a period of retraction in Shetland to those broch settlements. Now, in its heyday, the broch would have been the most imposing structure, the most prestigious structure in the landscape, think Musa. But by the kind of period I'm talking about, by 500, a broch settlement looked more like this picture here. This, in fact, is the shell of the broch with a house, a later house, built inside it. That's actually a nice reconstruction of old Scatness, but it gives you an idea of the later dwellings gathered around the former broch. Around 500, we have two broch settlements in the area we're looking at. But you'll notice 
they're up the north, they're in the middle, there's nothing at the south end. Now, it may be because it's unoccupied, but uh, to trot out the old cliché, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, but we are talking about very low archaeological visibility, a few potsherds leaking out of middens, that kind of thing. Now, the agricultural soil in this part of Shetland, it occurs in small pockets. It's almost all anthropogenic, so it's take, taken time to, to build up. And when people have built up these pockets of soil, they tend to stay <coughs> in that place for centuries. And the soil in the South End is actually quite good. It's quite light, it's sandy, it's easily worked. In fact, to be honest, the soil up at Burland in the North is probably harder work than some of the stuff in the South and yet it seems unoccupied, around 500. Later, um, when the priests and monks known as Papa arrive in Shetland, they don't establish themselves at either of the Broch settlements. They don't go to Broch, they don't go to Berland. They settle in the apparently unoccupied south in a place later known as the Papa place, Papal. And I think part of this explanation <coughs> lies in this accessibility from the sea. So we'll have a look at what's happening with the sea. Since humans first settled in Shetland, the sea has risen relative to the land and fallen and then risen again, and it's still rising. Now, given its position relative to the main ice sheets, the trend of sea level movement <coughs> around Shetland is actually analogous with, and this was a surprise to me, the Wick River Valley. The trend of sea level movement around Shetland is analogous to there. And a study by Dawson and Smith um, looked at the fluctuations of sea level in the Wick River Valley at this point, and the graph shows the relevant section. What they see is sea level rise speeding up from 780 onwards. Now that's the trend. The actual change in sea level can be exaggerated in particular localities depending on the formation of the shore. And in Shetland, there's reason to think that estimated rise of one meter is very conservative. But the point is, for our area, any rise is pretty bad news. The Admiralty chart on the right shows you how shallow is the topography around these islands. The blue areas are less than five meters deep. In actual fact, they're usually shallower than that. So small movements in sea level, huge implications for our study area. It's not just that your soft agricultural soil is washed away, so of course also is the archaeological evidence we might otherwise have found. And it's also a problem of process. It starts as the sea rises, the dry land becomes marsh and bog, you get tidal creeks. It gets to that stage before, with a little more rise, it becomes shallow sea again. Dry land, you can walk across. Shallow sea, you can cross on a boat. The stuff that's really difficult is your tidal creeks and your mud. So I think these geographical changes may go some way towards explaining what is happening around the south end. Around 200 the sea level is lower. So most of that blue area is going to be land, and those white um, <coughs> points in the blue, they're probably lochs. By 500, when the population's already on the move in Shetland back to Brock settlements, the sea is rising, this is the land that's getting lost, this is the land that's getting boggy. And that kind of thing can only accelerate a general movement away to other settlements. By 700, when the Papar arrive, that rising sea may have crossed the um, shallow bar here. You can still see the high shallow part um, on the seabed now. The sea may have crossed over there, look straight up into the log. Over the next little bit, look very easily. You've got water all the way up to the Papar place. Now, we don't know what boats the monks used. Um, traditionally, it's thought to have been a conical or similar. The south part of our study area is actually very inviting for a conical. Now, that's Tim Severin's Brendan on the left. It wasn't an archaeological reconstruction, for those of you who remember it, but it does show the capabilities of that kind of structure, light wooden structure <coughs> covered in hide. 
And I was rather amused to, to learn that when, in fact, they were trialing that boat, which of course eventually went to Iceland and America, so it, it was very capable of long voyages, but when they were first learning how to steer it, they did so in a reed-lined lake, because if they misjudged it, they got wedged in the reeds, but the boat didn't get damaged. So I think this changing access, this type of boat, makes some sense of the patterns of settlement that we appear to see in that part of the study area. The next settlers are famously the Norse. They begin to arrive, I hate to put dates on this, I'll say 850-ish, and they quickly achieve saturation in terms of um, filling the islands. But I think their pattern of settlement and how they expanded is also affected by similar considerations of maritime access. I'm not going to go into detail on this slide. Um, we need to think about how the North settled and the pattern of, the pattern of expansion. We know which settlements were occupied in 1300 because in the late 13th century, the Norwegian crown carried out a big reassessment of the rent and tax due from Shetland. And the framework of that reform lasted centuries into the 19th century. The 17th century documents, which give details of rent and tax, list the name settlements, and they're a valid guide because in many respects, 1600 is quite like 1300. And the reasons you can um, make an analogy between these two periods were set out in some detail by Brian Smith, the Shepherd Archivist, who isn't in the room. Um, <laughs> she checks quickly. Um, he published a paper in about 2011. So there is um, a com comparison to be made between the periods. I'm not saying they're identical, but they are similar. And for the period before 1300, place name studies reckon that um, certain place name elements occur earlier than others. So it's possible to create a sequence. Almost all Shetland place names are Norse. So these are the names I'm talking about. So with that background, I think it's possible to suggest a maybe pattern of expansion in our area. Now, that date of 1100 is just to indicate at some point in between 900 and 1300 to give you a feel for the um, development. The red stars show places with names typical of each fresh expansion. And the map on the right shows settlements which are known from earliest documents. Now there's two places of interest. Up here, we have a place name which is not the earliest type of place name, and we'll look at that a little later. What is, I think, really interesting is this space here. We appear to have no names for that space. And if the place names on the right represent the taxable settlements of 1300, we have a slight problem. Because the three longhouses, or there were three longhouses, every single one has now eroded into the sea. Three longhouses on that site. Now they were examined by um, Ease Archaeology, who did a big coastal survey and in fact going to publish the book on that fairly soon. They thought 10th to 14th century for each one of those. Now there's no documented name, but if that settlement was empty by the late 13th century, then it wouldn't be caught and recorded in the tax assessment anyway. It's not a particularly good place for cultivation. The longhouses were the last dwellings there. So even when the population of Shetland was at its height in the second half of the 19th century, nobody was desperate enough to go and try and carve out a patch of cultivation on that part of North Pus. That particular part's called Falsies Air, hence the name at the top. So if it's not that good, there's no reason for the people in the longhouses to hang about then. And it's possible that you've actually, we've actually a settlement here that was <coughs> occupied maybe around 800, but empty by 1300. So why pick it in the first place? And but then, why leave? Remember the sea rise was getting faster from around 780. If the Norse are arriving in Shetland, 8th to 9th century, was stream sound there newly opened at that period? I said it was a very shallow sound. Has the rising sea perhaps only 
<coughs> fairly recently, in geographical terms, made that accessible. It is still shallow and full of shoals, but it might have been deep enough for shallow drafted vessels like long ships. There's a low shore where those um, long houses are, easy to beach a, a long ship. It's not a bad landfall. But times and ships change. When the, these are all replicas, obviously. When the Norse arrive and they're sailing what we call long ships, draft about one metre. The cargo carrying starts quite early. We know about the trading towns established on the continent in the 8th century. The replica Knar, top right, draws 1.2 metres, but it is a little on the small side for what is likely to have come to Greenland, to the other colonies, and to Shetland. So the Knars coming here probably drew a little bit more. Larger capacity implies bulk cargoes, so the value is in the quantity. They're not shipping luxuries, they're into commodities. And that trend continues with the development of the last ship up, the cog. That's a replica of the Bremen cog, and the reason it says 1380 is that's the date put on the Bremen cog. <coughs> Slightly outside our period, but it illustrates our trend. Fully laden, that boat draws 2.25 metres. So if you've only got three metres to play with, that's no fun at all. Plus, as we heard earlier today, cogs slightly less manoeuvrable too. So I think this question of ship's draft and the question of the available depth of water may have been one of the factors contributing to the establishment of that little settlement in Falsies Air and later to its decline. And so to the later part of our period. The Norse begin to convert to Christianity officially around 1000, and the, uh, the busy construction of churches and chapels which follows gives us a guide to where the population was living in the 11th to 12th centuries. Hmm. You remember Berland, the rock settlement? No ch church or chapel. Papel has one, a successor to the uh, original Papa's church perhaps. Broch, a Broch settlement, the place in the name, that has a chapel, but Berland does not. The chapel is up here. Now, in 16th century documents, the name Trondra didn't mean the island, it meant only that northeast corner. It went on, and by the 1780s, it was the most populous and fertile part of the island. We've got lots of documents about that. It was just known as the Heim Tun. And it's actually, uh, one reason for its fertility is it's on crystalline limestone. And the soil that you get from that is fertile but thin. But then traditional agricultural methods will enrich and deepen the available soil. On the face of it, that looks a better bet than whilst is there for settlement. So why is there no early Norse settlement? Again, I've got to ask myself, did sea level change play a part? Perhaps around the time the Norse were first arriving, this was a dead end. In which case, this gives you more options boat-wise. Now the growth of the settlement, called Trondra up there, it, the, its slightly later foundation may be due to some change in the sea level, but Perhaps its increasing importance has got more to do with the harbour just to the north, the one that nowadays we call Scalloway Harbour. Now, the modern harbour has a bar here at the entrance. Now, it's um, officially seven to eight metres deep. They need to dredge it every few years. I know this because I live very close to it, and I can say that in 2010 they had to carry out blasting to deepen that channel. The house shook. <laughs> <laughs> These western approaches, they need care and they need some local knowledge. There's a nasty little rock called the Bullia Skerry, which is about today 1.2 meters below the top of the sea. That'll tear the bottom out of your heavily laden cog. We've also now, of course, got a southern access here. There's the muscle scarp, so you've got quite a narrow, bendy channel. It is another way in. But 
If you go back into the centuries before 1300, sea's a little lower, but as it rose towards near modern level, what's happening up in this northern part north of Trondra is this channel is becoming more usable as the sea rises, <coughs> it's getting deeper, and you've also got the opening up of this southern access. Now, it's not so much the navigational options that are created by that southern access, it's what it does to the tidal currents, because now the tide can swing round the whole of the north part of the island. And that means you've got the sea scouring out material in some places and depositing it as silt elsewhere. So it changes a lot of things as soon as that um, possible um, plug is, is taken away. Now we've got this medieval chapel sitting on Trondra. The construction of these medieval churches and chapels reflects increased organisation by the church and more enthusiastic tax raising as well. Secular power is also organising. Those deeper drafted boats like the cogs, they need piers and jetties. A low shore is no use to them. They need something permanent in the way of constructions. And your local, depends how you look at it, I will call them prominent citizens, have a strong interest in taxing the trade. They provide piers and jetties. They will maintain the peace. They will enforce the peace so that the negotiations can be carried out, so that goods can be exchanged. But that, let us understand, is all in exchange for a cut, a levy, a tax. And so, as we get up to 1300, the settlement of Trondra is becoming a busier place. So, to summarise, we see the focus of settlement shift. We start with Broch and Berland, then the Papar arrive and start a new centre, and by the end of our period, Berland has gone and given way to Trondra. And I think that part of the explanation lies in this maritime access, this combination between depth of available water and draft required by contemporary shipping. Area 1 starts off as good land as the tide rises, it becomes bog and marsh and then from the, as the sea rises more it becomes accessible. Up in area 2, that same rising sea makes it first accessible to settlers and then less attractive because you can't get the larger ships in. And up at area 3, as the sea rises, it begins to open up the options for Scalloway and make that more suitable for the heavier vessels. Geography is not destiny, but at the level of detail, it certainly affects who settles on which particular plot of land. That's fascinating, especially uh, I recognise I know all the places that you're talking about. <laughs> Are there any questions? John? Uh, fascinating, Deborah. I've really enjoyed hearing you speak. Um, I want to make a comment and then one question. My comment is that this is great because so many historians forget about the sea when they're trying to analyse what happens in the past. That the sea was the motorways of and the sea, as you've shown today, has been absolutely crucial to understanding where people live on the land. So it's great to see that. Uh, my question is, uh, Trondra not appearing as the island in these early records, but appearing in the northeast portion of Trondra. I always thought that Trondra was Trondra Oi, Trondra's island. It is. So, uh, but, so it did mean the whole island, even though it was just referred to as an artista? Not necessarily. Um, we tend to think, uh, in terms of place names, that anything ending in oi is an island. And that was my immediate thought when I first started looking at this, that uh, uh, Trondra is often described as Trander's oi, Trander being um, a personal name. It's, it's that chap's island. 
But when I looked up Jacobson, who's a bit of a Bible for Shetlanders, seeking to look at place names and at the Old Norse language, and how in fact that was preserved in Shetland dialect, um, Jacobson says that it does occur in the name of peninsulas, and I've, I can give you a reference for that, and in some places it means not so much peninsula as flat, fertile stretch of land along the water. <coughs> And uh, that's a slightly different reference, um, but when I saw that written, I thought that would explain it. And might also explain why that important settlement never had any other name, because in the 1780s, when there's a lot of documentation being generated by the um, state owner's factor, he refers to that simply as the Heim Tun. It's, it's the home farm. Well, I have a, thank you so much. Um, that was great. I have a, a comment, and this may well be old hat to you, but it was sort of a moment of revelation to me recently. So I'm living at the moment in Arkadeli in northern Iceland, and the name Arkad is like a field, and Eiri means uh, a sandbank or a spit of land. And, you know, my recent visits to Orkney and Shetland, I, was, I see this place name, Air, A-Y-R-E, everywhere, and I suddenly thought, gosh, it's, it's the same word, it's a, it's a spit of land. It is, yes. and it does occur in Shetland place names as well. Yeah. Um, Firth, up in uh, the north part of mainland, is thought to refer to Eire, to um, a spit, and I'm delighted to tell you, this particular um, valley here is known as Uradale, <coughs> and I think it's the valley and referring to that spit mm. that we now call the Muscle Scarp yeah. that comes off just at that settlement there. Well, I think uh, that sort of, uh, everyone's got to make. Let's go enjoy that. So, uh, thank you very much, Deborah.